with a big rule change on kickoffs having quite an impact on how NFL teams are evaluating personnel, the Seahawks have added another explosive athlete to their receiving core and special teams unit. We'll be diving into where LaVisca Chenault fits in coming up next here on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined for our Wednesday episode by my co host in crime. Rob Rang, and a special thanks to all the 12s tuning in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Whether you're listening in in nearby Port Townsend, Washington, or across the globe in Brisbane, Australia, we greatly appreciate each and every one of you. We are now getting closer to three weeks away from the NFL draft. We talked offensive guards yesterday in the trenches. We're going to look in the secondary today. We're going to break down safety prospects even first rounders, whether it's day twos, day threes, sleepers, we've got it all covered on today's show, which is brought your way by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked in NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Now for your lead story here on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks at the NFL annual meetings a few weeks ago, John Schneider made it clear that the Seahawks were taking a closer look at some candidates to bring in with the new kickoff rule being accepted by owners, an XFL-style kickoff, and within a week later, the Seahawks have made a signing that could have a major impact now on their return game. LaVisca Chenault, former Colorado standout, started with the Jaguars, a second-round pick, spent the last two years with the Carolina Panthers, joining the Seahawks on a one-year deal. And Rob, on the surface, a lot of 12s are going to think, wait, we already have a receiver that can play to the slot that's supposed to break tackles, create after the catch, and D. Eskridge, he just hasn't done it since we drafted him. And now you're looking at a player on his third team in five seasons, and yet this feels like a player who has at least somewhat lived up to expectations compared to what D. Eskridge has. And 27 yards per kickoff return in his career – With the new rules, it makes all the sense in the world to give this guy a one-year flyer. You're muted, Rob. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Sorry, I'm so excited to talk about LaVisca Chenault that I put myself on mute there for just a moment. Um, You know, uh, you know. To me, it makes all the sense in the world why the Seahawks uh, brought in a player. This is, we're talking about a guy who has uh, a very high ceiling uh, and a, in my opinion, a very high floor if he can stay healthy. Um, that, of course, has been the problem for LaVisca Chanel, going back to his days at Colorado. And I love the fact that you mentioned kind of in a comparison contrast kind of style with D. Eskridge, who, uh, of course, is basically about 5'10", 200 pounds. LaVisca Chanel is 6'1", 220. Um, you know, and if the Seahawks are, in fact, going to be using Chanel and Eskridge as their, their two-player tandem um, now that the NFL has made made their adjustments and how they're going to use kickoffs. And again, I just like the fact that you have two very different style of players. They're returning those kicks. And then again, LaVisca Chenault as a slot receiver, as a guy that can take some, re, uh, take some reverses and things of that nature. Yep. To me, he is one of the most versatile playmakers in all of the NFL. And the fact that he's been in the league for four seasons, uh, I, I think that a lot of times people, just forget about players. We, we've seen the Seahawks do this at the quarterback position before. They they saw a Drew Locke. They saw a Geno Smith. They obviously saw a Sam Howell and said, hey, we think this guy can be actually better than what he has shown so far. Let's give him a second run. Obviously, now here with LaVisca Chenault, you're talking about a third run, but he's still only 25 years old. And this is a guy that has great size, great physicality, and pre- pretty damn impressive agility as well as speed. 
I think that this is one of those kind of feast or famine type of selections here in the second wave of free agency that the Seahawks could look awfully smart if LaVisca Chanel is able to recapture the form that allowed him to become that second round selection. As you mentioned, the Jacksonville Jaguars years ago and a, and a superstar when there were not very many of them at the University of Colorado. So again, I really like this move. I think that it makes Seattle's receiving core that much more versatile and he is a guy that adds a little bit of thump to a receiving core that other than DK Metcalf is all about speed and precision rather than a little bit of power and nastiness. When you look at Chenault's first two years in the league when he was in Jacksonville, particularly his rookie season, over half of his receiving yards and he hit 600 as a rookie, that's decent numbers, especially with the Jaguars quarterback situation at that point. But he was able to produce more than half his yardage after the catch. This is one of those players that when he gets the football in his hands, he turns into a running back at 6'1", 220. I actually could see, and, and I'm just throwing this name out there because Cordell Patterson was drafted yep. early by the Minnesota Vikings. And first couple of years in the league, there were flashes, but he really never met the expectations of being a top pick, but he was a big bodied guy that ended up moving to running back and had some pretty good seasons as a running back in Atlanta. He's been one of the best kick returners in the league. And you look at Chenault's career going back to his college days at Colorado. He only had a handful of kick and punt returns. They hardly used him in that capacity. The only punt return he had in his three years on campus, he took back for a touchdown though. The guy has been dynamic when he's been used in that capacity, but Teams have not used him much until the last couple of years. Carolina started to experiment more with him as a kick returner, and he averaged 27 yards per return for them. This is a guy that isn't necessarily the burner. He's not a 4-4 guy, ran in the upper 4-5s four, four a couple of years back coming out of Colorado, but he's 220 pounds. And I think when you look at the new kickoff rules, and I'm going to put this diagram up. Those of you watching on YouTube, I'm going to explain for our audio listeners as well. But these new rules – I think having a running back style return man is going to be more beneficial than it was in the past because of the way things are set up. The kick return team, all of your kick coverage guys are starting at the opposing 40 yard line. They're five yards apart from the return blockers. So this is really more going to be about the return men. And there's two of them at the five yard line being able to read blocks like a running back instead of the old school kickoff rules where everybody was spread out and guys were trying to make these explosive cuts. Now you're going to be reading it almost as if it's a run play. So I think a player like LaVisca Chenault, who's 220 pounds, that has ran the football effectively when he's had his opportunities in the NFL and he has the ability to break a lot of tackles, those kind of guys could be bigger threats in the return game now with these new rules, Rob than what they may have been with the former rules. No, I 100% agree with you. And I love the fact that you just put that graphic up there. I, I think that if you can see, those of you watching on YouTube, thank you always to those of you watching as well as those of you listening. Those of you listening, you may not be able to see what is called the landing zone, essentially from the 20-yard line back to the goal line. And that is a huge space that now Seattle is going to be having, as, as well as every other NFL team, of course, is going to be having two different guys out there who are able to catch that, off and then be able to make something happen. To me, that's exactly where D. Eskridge has shown his greatest flashes, and there is no doubt where LaVisca Chenault has shown his flashes as well. As you as you just mentioned, I mean, his rookie season um, with Jacksonville Jaguars, I mean, it was half of his yardage was after the catch. Just this past season when he was a kind of a do-it-all performer for the Carolina Panthers prior to going down with his latest injury, uh, you know, he was a guy that not only caught some balls out of the backfield, but was a return man and actually lined up at running back for some of his more impressive plays. Yep. He was a running back. And so to me, it's the, I, I love the fact that you mentioned Corderell Patterson. To me, there's so many, uh, elements of both of their play that that really do match up very nicely and one of the reasons why as i mentioned before that uh chenault is just 25 years old i really think that he's gonna do the exact same thing that corderell patterson did become a better player as he gained more experience in the nfl and again his vision his power his agility 
all these things to me translate to a guy that should be able to absolutely explode for the Seahawks, who of course lost their primary kick returner from the last couple of years in DJ Dallas. So uh, I do think that this is a move to bolster their kick return game. I also am really intrigued by what LaVisca Chanel has shown, albeit in flashes as a receiver as well. And one last thing here, there are some Seahawk fans out there that have, uh, you know, thrown out the idea of possibly trading DK Metcalf. And I've always kind of pushed back against that because I don't like the idea of trading away your best players. But at the same time, one of the areas of concern I've had for the Seahawks for a while now is they just do not have very many receivers other than DK Metcalf who are six foot one or bigger that can play a little bit of the bully ball that Mike McDaniels used to be able to play at Baltimore and uh, the Michigan Wolverines, of course. And that's to me one of the things that makes LaVisca Chenault, uh, LaVisca Chenault, excuse me, uh, a fun little roll of the dice here for the Seahawks because there's going to be some really talented wide receivers going to come up off the board here a couple of weeks from now, but none of them have the pro experience, of course, that Chanel has, and very few of them have his size, speed, and physical combination. And he's younger than D. Eskridge, even though he's got exactly. one more year of NFL experience. So there are a number of intriguing things here. We'll see what happens. This is a deep receiving core. You do have Jake Bobo coming back, Derek Young's coming back, Eskridge back in a restructured contract. That is going to be very competitive especially Seattle adds a receiver in this upcoming draft as well. There's a lot of different variables at play here, but I am with you. I think that this is a fascinating buy low, potentially win big gamble signing for a young player that can do a lot of different things as long as he stays healthy. And I'm really intrigued by him in this new kickoff system that the NFL has officially implemented. Up next, we're going to take a look at safeties. First round and day two prospects. That'll be coming up next year on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. If you want to see the Seattle Kraken at Climate Pledge Arena before they close out the season, thank to Game Time's awesome Flash deals feature in a detailed stadium map. You can get excellent seats to see the Kraken at home for under $100, and it's super easy. Forget playing months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event, and the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the very best price. If you find tickets in the same section in a row for less elsewhere, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. You're listening to the Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to each and every one of the twelves listening in. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks. Your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. The NFL draft, we are closing in on three weeks until the festivities begin in Detroit. Yesterday, we kicked things off. Maybe the biggest need for the Seahawks on their entire roster. We're going to transition to the defense with our first position group today. And safety isn't one of the bigger needs at this point for Seattle because they did sign Rayshon Jenkins and Kayvon Wallace. They also have Julian Love, the Pro Bowler, returning in the final year of his current contract. So there's some experience. There's some veteran players with versatility at that spot. And yet Jenkins basically is on a two-year deal that could be a one-year deal. Kayvon Wallace is on a one-year deal, and Love's going to be a free agent next March. So, Rob, this is still very much from a long-term perspective, a position that the Seahawks could attack earlier than some may expect in this draft, especially if a do-it-all player like Cooper DeJean is available when they are on the board in round one. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that you just mentioned Cooper DeJean. I mean, just he is, to me, is the one guy that I think can play the safety position. He primarily played a corner for Iowa, and I, I think that he can stay at that position in the NFL. But still, kind of like we had the conversation yesterday's show and talked about guards, and we just kind of mentioned Troy Fautanu from, from Washington in passing. I, I think the Cooper DeJean, again, is likely to play corner, but – 
I also think that he has the instincts, the size, the open field tackling skills to absolutely project as a star uh, at the safety position. And so if he is available to see out number 16 overall, and that's the guy that, that Mike McDonald wants, then yeah, I'm all on board with that idea. Yeah. I think the more likely scenario, however, would be for Seattle to wait until what I consider at least to be the sweet spot for safeties this year, and that being on day two. And of course, right now, the Seahawks only have one selection there, number 81 overall in the third round. But still, I do think that there's a possibility of Seattle looks to trade down, and I think that there's going to be some really good quality safeties that are available at that 81st overall selection here. So I'm I'm just going to kind of mention a couple of players that I view as possible fits. You mentioned the fact that the Seahawks, of course, have Rashawn Jenkins and Kayvon Walls. They brought in as free agents. And I think that both of them are kind of interchangeable. In my opinion, both of them are at their best, a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage. I have a great deal of respect for Julian Love and what he was able to do this past season. But frankly, I don't think that any one of those three players that I just mentioned, they're currently on Seattle's roster, have the ball skills uh, that say, Quandre Diggs possesses, but I think the Tyler Newbin from Minnesota possesses that type of skill. Dadrian Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech's ha, Texas Tech, excuse me, has those type of skills. Uh, Cameron Kitchens from Miami has those type of skills. Newbin had 13 interceptions over his college career. Dadrian Taylor Demerson had 10. Kitchens had 11 in the past two seasons alone. So to me, if you were looking for that classic center fielder type of a free safety to complement what uh you know the, the the free agents that Seattle brought in and Rayshon Jenkins and Kayvon Wallace to me those three players Newman Taylor Demerson and Kitchens have that ability to play not only the deep free safety role but also be able to drop down and play a little bit of nickel coverage as well. I love that you mentioned Cameron Kitchens because Everybody's looking at the combine numbers, and I know he ran in the four sixes, and that is not fast for a safety. And yet, when you turn on the tape at Miami, the dude looks like he runs a four four on game tape. He's just a different style athlete, and you see this happen every year. There are guys that just are faster in pads than they are wearing the underwear Olympics apparel that we see in Indianapolis every year. And Kinchins is one of those guys. He is a heat-seeking missile. He'll come up and he'll deck you. He's, as you mentioned, double-digit interceptions at Miami. So he's got ball skills for days. He can play in the box. He can play back as single or too deep safety, a split safety look. The guy is a fantastic football player. So I don't care about the 4-6 40 time. I've seen him run faster in game film and, and he's the kind of versatile chess piece that Mike McDonald likes. I want to touch on Dadrian Taylor Demerson though, because this guy is one of my absolute favorite defensive players in this draft class, not just for safeties and the misconception. I think a lot of people, when they think of a stud safety in the pass heavy uh, big 12, they think, Oh, this guy just has a lot of interceptions because they're throwing the ball so much. But this guy does way more than just pick off passes. He is one of the cleanest tackling safeties in this class. And he only blitzed six times last year. He generated six pressures and a sack with those press, with those blitzes. So he had a 100% pressure rate on limited opportunities. You know Mike McDonald's going to see that on film. He has talked about the importance of blitzing in his defense, everybody being able to do it. This guy can play some in the box. He's that interchangeable chess piece. And the last one that I really want to discuss on day two that I'm really excited about, Javon Bullard from Georgia, who I call him Bullard the Bullet because he runs a 4-4-7. He plays at that speed on the field. He is more of a free safety slot type, not a lot of experience playing in the box, but he's a capable hitter. This is a guy that didn't give up any touchdowns last year in coverage, had a couple picks, five pass breakups. And he's really a sound tackler, just not a guy that plays a lot in the box. But he has had limited experience blitzing. I don't care. He can play a number of different positions. He can play the slot, can defend quick receivers. There's a lot to like about him. He has been one of the leaders on that Georgia defense the last few years. And we know the talent that has come out of that NFL factory down there in Georgia. So uh, Bullard is another one that I really like that I think would fit Mike McDonald's scheme. All three players I just mentioned there, can play multiple positions, and that seems to be of great importance for Mike McDonald and his staff. 
Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Uh, you know, Buller is a, is a really good player. And again, kind of like I mentioned before with the other three players, Newbin, Taylor Demerson, uh, and, and Kinchins, and, and their ability to line up as nickel corners, that is one of the areas in which I really thought that Bullard was at his best for the Georgia Bulldogs a year ago. But you, know, you said Bullard the bullet, and it made me kind of laugh because one of my favorite safeties in this class, Cole Bishop, you know, there there's no – Bishop or BS to his game. And, and that's one of the things that, that I really like about Cole Bishop from the University of Utah, Corbin. I'm talking about a guy who has the versatility of some of these other players that we just mentioned, but he's got the size to actually come down and, and play a little bit more of a linebacker. He's 6'2", 205 pounds, but look just as comfortable in the box as he did playing that deep safety role. Um, he is a, uh, you know, a, has the ability to play deep and and create interception opportunities for himself also is a thunderous hitter when he's coming downhill as well so to me cole bishop is a player that i'm really excited about and while on the subject of pac-12 safeties this is a really good year for the conference at that position katana oladapo from oregon state 6'2 216 pounds jaden hicks from washington state 6'2 211 pounds they are you know for lack of a better uh you know, comparison, they're your Cam Chancellor types of, of this year's safety class. And that's not just for the Pac-12. That's for the the entire college football, uh, you know, scheme here. I mean, we, we're talking about two big guys that some people are going to view as possible linebacker converts. They can add a few more pounds to them. They do struggle a little bit in terms of just going up against the, the classic slot receivers. But if Mike McDonald is looking for a Kyle Hamilton type, a guy who can come into the box and really impose his physicality and his will, then to me, Oladapu and Hicks uh, from Corvallis and, and Pullman are, are two guys that I think the Seahawks are going to be very, very familiar with and uh, and also can fit in with exactly the type of scheme that McDonald used at least this past season with the Ravens. And we've talked about Hicks several times. His ability to blitz is as is polished as any of these safeties. So yep. that is another guy that really fits that multifaceted type safety that Mike McDonald wants. So keeping him in the state of Washington would make a lot of sense. Probably in that third round, around that 81st spot, he might not be there. He might be there. It remains to be seen. But that seems like the sweet spot early to mid-third round for Hicks to potentially go. When we come back, there's a bunch more safeties that we haven't touched on on day three. Maybe not the deepest position group, but yet there's some pretty intriguing safeties that could fit Mike McDonald's scheme that should be available on day three. We'll dive into that up next here on our Wednesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament with the Final Four set to kick off in Phoenix this weekend. Whether you're betting on future NFL tackle DJ Burns and North Carolina State to continue sporting a glass slipper or UConn to pull off a rare repeat, FanDuel makes it more exciting to get in on the action. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. With four trips or four teams left in the field, all options are on the table at your fingertips. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You're listening to the Wednesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s listening in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. It is much appreciated. Continuing to take a deep dive into this year's safety class for the 2024 NFL Draft. It's time to talk day three sleepers or gems, whatever term you want to use for those under the radar prospects that could be exciting. And Rob, you and I are both going to gush over this kid. And and I've been gushing about him for three years. I saw Malik Mustafa play against Notre Dame three years ago at Wake Forest. And he had an interception, a sack, a couple of big hits in that game. And I just saw a guy that he looked like Ugo Amadi, former Seahawks nickel corner on steroids. That's what jumped out to me. He just looked like a guy that was just a bigger better, harder-hitting version of Ugo Amadi with more ball skills. Now, he hasn't had a ton of interceptions, but some of that has been because quarterbacks in the ACC have just avoided him for the most part. 
And this guy had a four sack season a few years ago. I just look at his skill set, a guy that's played in the box, free safety. He can play the nickel. He can defend quick, speedy receivers. Not the biggest guy, but he plays like a big hitting, strong safety. I just love everything about this kid. I think his size keeps him on day three, but he's probably a strong fourth round pick consideration at this point. And Mike McDonald would like that well-rounded skill set. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned the size. I mean, he, he's short. Uh, you know, he's 5'10", but he's 209 pounds. I mean, I was just kind of gushing about guys like Oladapu from Oregon State at 216 pounds, but he's 6'2", or, or Jaden Hicks, 6'2", 211 pounds. You know, Malik Mustafa is kind of a, a squatty guy, but he is absolutely yoked. And, and so uh, 5'10", 209 pounds is what he measured in officially at the Combine. And, you know, you just look at him i mean he looks like a little a mini linebacker out there but he is a, a high four fours low four fives kind of a guy you mentioned the ball skills um you know he, he's a playmaker that there are some missed tackles on tape and i think that some people are going to focus in on that but i love the aggression i mean when you're playing for wake forest then you don't have the the surrounding town of say a javon bowler to georgia for example and you're if you are going to make big plays they're going to allow the demon deacons to win big football games in the ACC, then you have got to have the courage to make those big plays. And that's one of the things that I like about Mustafa. And I think that he really kind of stands out. Now I'm going to go in a completely different realm here in terms of a guy that also has a little bit of feast or famine to his game, made some big plays, but also surrendered some big plays. And I think may actually push him down the board a little bit further, maybe not into day three, but Caleb Bullock from US SC is a guy that is 6'2", but he's only 188 pounds. I mean, he's 30 pounds lighter than Malik Mustafa. I mean, he is basically kind of a string bean out there, but he is more of a traditional free safety. He does have the ball skills. He can make some splashy plays that make you basically drool from a scouting perspective. At the same time, he also will lower his head trying to make some big tackles and, and basically whiff. And so that, to me, is one of the concerns that could push him into the middle or even the day, middle rounds or even day three uh, of this draft. And so to me, that's one of the things I like about this safety class is the Seahawks, I expect them to take a safety because as we talked about, they've got a lot of bodies, but not a lot of guys who are signed past this upcoming season. To me, Kalen Book, Malik Mustafa are, are two of the players that really make a great deal of sense for the Seahawks to just consider as a long-term investment both those players are coming from power five conference schools they've gotten some buzz as potential day two players both these guys have but there's a chance they sneak into early day three slip a little bit because there is some inconsistency on their tape i want to go to a guy that isn't getting talked about much he didn't get a combine invite didn't have a great pro day workout four six nine forty for a safety is not that good of a time at all but when you watch Kenny Logan Jr. at Kansas, we're talking the wide open wild, wild west Big 12 where they're slinging the ball over the place. He didn't give up a single touchdown in coverage for a Kansas team that eclipsed all expectations last year. He was one of the unsung leaders of that Jayhawk squad that upset Oklahoma late in the season. This guy's a playmaker too. He had a couple interceptions. He got his hands on the football for a few pass breakups. Gave up less than 100 yards after the catch. When a guy makes a catch against him, he gave early career, he gave up some big plays downfield, but he really cut down on that last year. And he is a box safety that can play the split safety looks. So he doesn't have quite as much versatility in the sense you aren't going to put him in the slot unless he's in, against a tight end because of his speed. But he is a playmaker. He'll come up and smack you. And another bigger bodied safety that's in that 210, 215 range that has some positional versatility and could also star on special teams. So this is a guy that I'm really excited about from Kansas. Just the fact he didn't give up any touchdowns and coverage in that league and he played in every game. That's pretty darn impressive.
It is. If we want to throw out statistics out there, then let's just kind of go to Montlake again, University of Washington and Dom Hampton. I mean, you're talking about another guy, 6'2", 215 pounds. He ran a 4'5", officially at the Combine. I went to the UW Pro Day, and I watched this kid at, at decide that he wanted to run the 40-yard dash again because at 215 pounds, a 4.51 just wasn't fast enough for him. Went out there, ran it one time, and every what my own watch i have it a four four five um and then i talked to the scouts right next to me they have it anywhere between four four three and and four five oh so again he ran the one time basically just kind of looked at us and smirked like yeah that's what i typically do led the huskies and tackles this past season he is a guy that has the production has the physical body type to warrant a little bit of a risk again like i mentioned before with Kalen bullock from usc there are some missed tackles on tape there's no question about it um, but at the same time, in terms of a long-term uh, investment, to me, uh, Dom Hampton from the University of Washington is exactly what you're looking for on day three as far as a lottery ticket the safety position. When you're talking lottery tickets in terms of the ability to get the Powerball, I want to shift my attention to the Naval Academies. Let's talk Air Force right now. Yep. Trey Taylor, I don't know how he is falling under the radar the way that he is. And he ran a 4.5940 at his pro day workout, which wasn't quite as fast as I thought he was going to run. I thought he was going to be in the low 4.5s, maybe even the high 4.4s watching his tape. But he had a 6.9 second three cone at 6'1", 210 pounds. That is really good change of direction for a safety of that size. He had a couple of really nice sacks last year as a blitzer. He racked up 100 tackles last year for Air Force. He also only gave up one touchdown, had three interceptions, four pass breakups. This guy checks off every box you're looking for, and yet nobody has been talking about him. He was in the East-West Shrine Bowl, didn't get a Senior Bowl invite, and everyone's going to look at the competition. He played Mountain West, but Mountain West has had some really good NFL players come out of that conference over the years. And I think Trey Taylor has a chance to be the next good one because he can play in the box some. He's really a free safety by trade, but he's played over 700 snaps in the slot in his college career as well. He's got the athleticism and change of direction skills to at least be a big nickel candidate if you want to use him that way. I'm really excited about this kid. If you can't tell from how I'm talking right now, but this is a guy that he is truly my diamond in the rough in the safety position. And I don't know how he's a diamond in the rough with the production, the pro day numbers, and just looking at the guy, he is jacked. No, he is. I mean, he, he was the Thorpe Award winner. I mean, so certainly he is well known in terms of the media. And I assure you from the NFL scouting perspective as well, he just the fact that he was not invited to the combine, I, I think just kind of suggests that, 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 that there's the NFL clubs out there who view him as more of a day three pick. But I'm 100 percent on board with you. I, I see a guy who has instincts, he has toughness um, and, and he is dependable. So, again, on day three. I am 100% on board in selecting Trey Taylor because I do believe that he has the heart as well as the physical ability to wind up being a quote-unquote surprise at the NFL level. He's also incredibly intelligent. Being from Air Force and what those players are asked to do off the field, the guy has instincts for days. He scored a 9.3 relative athletic score, which is darn good for any safety at that position. So uh, I can keep gushing about this kid. He's one of my favorites on day three. If the Seahawks took him in the fourth round. I wouldn't bat not. I think he has that kind of talent and he fits this scheme with his positional versatility. And I think that's the one thing we can say about the safety group. You don't have a lot of blue chippers. You don't have a lot of future stars in this safety class. And I think that the depth does dry up some by the middle of day three, but there are a lot of versatile safeties in this draft class that you can move around. Tyke Smith from George is another one that plays like a linebacker at around 205, 210 pounds, and he'll smack you. He's got some ball skills, more of a box guy. I mean, you can find versatile safeties that have that sub package ability at minimum and could be starters that you can move around as chess pieces. There's a lot of them in this draft class. So from Seattle's long-term perspective, I could see him going out and getting at least one safety in this draft class that they can mold into a potential starter down the road because there are a lot of guys that could fit that bill 
in this scheme. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Make sure to subscribe to Locked On Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up tomorrow, going to be continuing a series I started last week. Going to be ranking defensive position groups for the Seahawks heading into the 2024 NFL Draft. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and thanks for listening in. Go Hawks.